Let's begin with a word of prayer. Will you bow down your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to study your word in freedom and in grace. We ask, Lord, that you let your Holy Spirit move in our midst and superintend our thoughts and give us understanding, Lord, and insight into your word. Help us, Father, to discover the reasons behind the hope that we have in our hearts and learn how to give an answer to those who will ask. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity once again. Bless us now as we fellowship around your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we originally planned this as a small Sunday school class, so... Uh, I'm a little surprised that uh, we're doing it here in ODA. Uh, and that's why I'm wearing a suit. No? Uh, I was planning to wear a t-shirt and jeans. But uh, considering that we're in ODA, I decided to dress up a little bit. Um, I think you have handouts with you. And of course, I'm sure you have your Bibles with you. And if you do, will you open them please to 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse 15. We will start with a short explanation of this verse and its surrounding context and then dive into the introduction to apologetics. We might not have enough time this morning to finish the whole material, so there is a point actually where we can, where we can end and then... Uh, open it up for some questions if you have any. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, quite surprised about the attendance and I hope that uh, you will find this time profitable for your own spiritual growth. Okay. Okay, First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, I read that uh, from the NIV version, and those of you who have already shifted to the ESV, uh, that version will read, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Now, I want to focus on that verse this morning before we actually start on the lesson so that we can get the proper context for apologetics. And I believe it is contained in the context of that passage. So we will be looking a few verses ahead and a few verses after verse 15 of First Peter. Uh, as a background, as you know, Peter, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, situated himself in Rome uh, and uh, was in, wrote this letter actually to encourage those who were uh, victims of the persecution in the history of the church after the church grew in Jerusalem and started spreading, uh, the Roman government started persecuting the church and scattered the members of the Jerusalem church uh, into the rest of Asia Minor and other parts. So Peter wrote this letter to encourage those who were persecuted into being scattered. So he called them the people of the dispersion. No? So in the immediate context of chapter 3, verse 15, uh, if you have your ESV Bibles with you, it says the title there of the section is Suffering for Righteousness' Sake, and that is really the context of that verse. So that verse was written in that context of Suffering for Righteousness' Sake. And I'll start a little bit in verse 13. So if you look at 1 Peter 13, uh, 1 Peter 3.13, it says, and now I'm reading in the ESV. Now, who is there to harm you 
if you are zealous for what is good. So he was talking to Christians who were being harmed already and persecuted. And he was telling them, if you do good things, generally, people will not harm you. So he says, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But that, of course, is not a guarantee. Many Christians, even during that time, in fact, were persecuted despite doing good. So you might think that if you take that verse out of context, you might think that I'm a Christian, it's impossible for people to persecute me. So obviously that's wrong. Because in verse 14, the very next verse, he said, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. So even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, suggests to us that as Christians, when we live out our faith, we can in fact suffer for righteousness' sake. In fact, in Matthew 5.10, in one of the Beatitudes, the Lord Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So here he was saying, it is a badge of honor if you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. It is not only a possibility, it's real. So that's the context. And then, he says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. The term have no fear of them, again, is like a badge of honor. Have no fear of them because like the prophets were persecuted, so you will be persecuted also. So don't be afraid of them. But, he said in verse 15, and this is where our apologetics key verse comes in, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. The sentence basically says that in our hearts, we are to separate Christ into the center of our hearts to worship Him completely, not just during worship service, but every day. So this is an everyday worship admonition from Peter. In your hearts, in the very center of your being, you set apart Christ. That's what it means to honor Christ the Lord as holy. You set him apart and worship him every day. How? He said, always being prepared to make an apologia. No, to make a defense. Um, apologetics, by the way, if you've probably already caught on to this, is not the art of apologizing for our faith. It is the defense of our faith. So do not apologize for being a Christian. Some people do. Some people feel ashamed that they are Christians. Um, especially those of my generation, when we first became Christians, when we were teenagers, it was not cool to be a Christian. No, I think um, even today, it is still not cool. No? But it was uh, not cooler then no, to be a Christian. Uh, you could not carry a Bible around. Your classmates will ridicule you. And I grew up in a Christian church, a Christian school. So we, bought, we, we got this Gideon's small pocket New Testament with the Psalms. And that was my Bible for many years because you can put that in your, the back pocket of your maong. No? So, the verse admonishes us to always be prepared. That's the Boy Scout motto. So we have to be Boy Scouts as far as defending the faith is concerned. What do we answer to? What do we talk about? We talk about the hope that is in you. The hope that is in you is salvation and the eternal life with God in heaven that comes, that is guaranteed by true saving faith. That is the hope 
that is within us. It is a certain hope. It's not a wishful hope. It is a certain hope that is within us. It is a living hope. In other words, we are not hoping we get to heaven. We are sure we're going to heaven. That's why we live this way. That's why we are always prepared to make a defense or to answer, to give an answer to those who ask about the hope, salvation that gives eternal life with God. That is the hope. That is what we possess. That is what we explain. So we need to know what we believe and why we believe in it. That's the essence of apologetics. We need to know what we believe and why we believe in it. Then, of course, the admonition of Peter here is, he says, yet, is that my fault? Okay, sorry. Maybe I'm speaking too loud. <laughs> yet, <laughs> okay. He said, yet, do it with gentleness and respect. So in other words, you don't hit people over the head with your giant King James Bible, right? You do it with gentleness. In other words, you speak gently, you speak softly, you speak in a non-protagonist, um, non non-aggressive way. Um, you don't badger them, you don't cut them off in mid-sentence, you don't speak rudely only because you know that you have the hope of eternal life. You, you will come across as holier than thou when you do that. He says, you speak gently and with respect. Now, this is the expression of our love towards those who still don't have the hope of eternal life. And it shows in the way that you give an answer to them. So when you make a defense, um, this is how you should do that. I'll say a little bit more about that in our introduction to apologetics later. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So it says, when you are slandered, that tells you that it is not if, it is when. So you are sure to be reviled, ridiculed, and slandered. It is a sure thing. When you speak to people about the hope of eternal life that is in you, people will ridicule you. They will ostracize you. That does not mean they will make you an ostrich. That means they will separate you. You do not belong to me. They will ostracize you. They will ridicule you. They will revile you. It is a guarantee. Jesus said in John 15, because the world hates me, it will hate you. So be prepared to be reviled, ridiculed, and slandered. When you are slandered, if you do your defense in gentleness and with respect, they will be put to shame. Then he ends with, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, following up from verse 14, even if you, are, if you suffer for righteousness sake. He says, even if that happens, if that is God's will in your life, that you suffer because of your faith, it is better to suffer because of your faith than for something else. So it's okay to suffer ridicule and reviling when we make a defense of our faith. Let's now go to uh, the introduction part of our handout. So you have handouts, and uh, I, it, it also uh, appears here in the PowerPoint slide, so we'll, we'll click to it. So for, for those who walked in a little bit late, don't worry, I just finished my Introduction to the introduction. Huh? Right. Okay, so you did not miss uh, too much. So we just went through this verse. 
And like I said, when we study apologetics, uh, don't be sorry. In other words, don't apologize for being a Christian. Uh, don't be ashamed of it. You can defend without being defensive. Uh, some people, when if they are if they are asked by their friends, "Hui Christian kadao? Oh, hindi ho." They become immediately defensive. Born again kadao? Oh, hindi ako born again ha. Baptist ako. No? Okay. So don't be defensive. You can defend your faith without being defensive. When people come to you and they say the Bible's full of contradictions, you can, without being defensive, just ask them, how did you come to that conclusion? Or why would you say so? Because if you ask people, if they tell you, oh, I don't believe in the Bible because it's full of contradictions, then you ask them, why did you say that? How, how come you came to that conclusion? Can you explain to me? You know, they can't. Because they've never even read the Bible that they say is full of contradictions. Or they say all religions are basically the same. No? You can just politely ask them, how did you come to that conclusion? And usually you'll find them stumped. Now, your objective is not to stump them. Okay? Your objective is to try to clarify what is the evidence that they are basing their belief on. Because if there is no evidence, then you can provide the evidence to the contrary. You see? So, no need to get defensive. You can argue without being argumentative. Uh, being argumentative is arguing the other person's point, whatever it is. So I will say something against your point. If you change your point, I will change my point. I will just argue against you. That's being argumentative. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's picking a fight. It's being contentious. And we're not to defend the faith that way. They may want you to go there. They may want to tempt you to get into an argument. And that's often what will happen. So we need to try to resist that. Maybe by saying that, no, I did not come here to debate with you. If you ask me to explain my faith, I will. But let me explain my faith. Now, this is very hard to do. If you are an argumentative person by nature, as I am, no, not to be argumentative when you argue is near impossible. No. So when I was younger, I tended to just out-talk the other person. So when they say, you know, I don't believe that God exists. Blah, 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 I will just overwhelm them with verbal diarrhea. No? And it doesn't go very far. You end up fighting. Um, this generation of ours today, the younger generation, uh, the millennials, no? uh, and the, what do they call Gen Z? Digital natives, no? our kids. They have this aversion to being judged. No? Hey, don't judge me, huh? No judgment, huh? No? And it is like foul to make any judgment. That's not true. We make judgments every day. We need to because how can you live a Christian life doing what is right in the eyes of God if you do not make judgments. It is sometimes um, an accusation to us that we are judgmental as Christians. Accept it. 
Now, when you judge people for things that you're guilty of, that is what Matthew 7.7 7 is against. Judge not that you be not judged. The context there is saying to the other person about the speck in his eye when you have a beam in yours. That's the context. It does not mean that you cannot judge ever. You have to make a judgment when you enter into apologetics because you are defending the truth against falsehood. So you have to make judgment. So, but do so, you can argue without being argumentative. Speak the truth in love. We are admonished to say that, to do that. Paul said, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here, or there, here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up unto him who is head, that is Christ. That's in Ephesians 4.14. Speaking the truth in love. Um, the original actually reads, truthing in love. So speaking the truth in love in the original uh, language actually translates, truthing in love. Yeah. One of our youth here is named Truthy. Is she here? No, she's not. So see, Truthy, parang yun yung word sa Greek. Truthing in love. Speak the truth in love. When we do that, it must come from a heart that really wants the best for the other person. Because if your intention is to simply put the other person down so that you will appear correct and therefore win the argument, you actually lose the person. Do you get that? You may want to win the argument, but lose the person. That's not our objective here. We do not want to win, to win debates. When we exercise the defense of our faith, when we exercise apologetics in evangelism, the objective is winning the person, not the debate. Did you get that? Winning the person, not the debate. Winning debates and arguments with other people will not save them. Okay, that's our introduction, no? and it's already 10 o'clock. <laughs> Who among you here already attended the morning worship service? Okay, about half. Who among you here are still going to the 10.30 service? Okay, marami, marami. We do not want you to be late. By the way, this is not a third morning service. Okay, it might look that way, but this is a Sunday school class. It just grew bigger than I thought it would be. But um, I thought you'd be around maybe 25 to 30 people max. So <laughs> I'm a little surprised. But uh, this is not a third morning service, huh? You might think, oh, I went to Sunday school already. I've done church. No. Okay? So it's good that you're going to the 1030. So we'll, we'll try to manage our time that way. So let's go to lesson one. Why defend my faith? So we already explained what Christian apologetics is. And now we will talk about why we should defend our faith. Firstly, Christian apologetics is a theoretical discipline no? because it bases itself on positions and propositions. So William Lane Craig, who's one of the famous apologists of our time, he defined apologetics as that branch of Christian theology 
which seeks to provide a rational justification for the truth claims of the Christian faith. It seeks to provide a rational justification. Now we all know that salvation is a spiritual truth, but it is a spiritual truth that arises out of propositions to the mind. So we have to engage the mind. That's why it is a theoretical discipline in a sense. It's not because it deals with theory. It deals with truth. It simply deals with propositions and positions that lead to belief. Because belief is anchored on truth. If there is no truth, it's impossible to have true faith. That's why you will, feel, uh, you will see all over scripture, especially if you read the book of Romans and you're a lawyer, you will see Paul the lawyer, because Paul was a lawyer. Uh, he was an expert in Old Testament law, and as a lawyer, he argued the faith systematically in the book of Romans, just like he was arguing a court case. When Paul does that, he is reasoning from the scriptures. So in that sense, when we do apologetics, we are reasoning from the scriptures. That's what we're doing. It's a theoretical discipline, but it has a practical application. The practical application is the following. First, it confirms for believers that the Christian faith is true. I don't know if that's... It's not there. It confirms for believers that the Christian faith is true. So for us, apologetics should strengthen our resolve to commit ourselves to our faith because it will confirm in our hearts that what we believe in our hearts, we see in our minds. Secondly, it will show unbelievers that the Christian faith is true. So it, these are the two practical applications. It will confirm to us who already believe that what we believe is the truth, and it will show unbelievers that what we believe is the truth. So that's the practical application. Now, there is offensive apologetics. Uh, let me clarify. Offensive apologetics is, a, is building a positive case for the faith. Okay? It is not offensive in the sense na it's nakakainis. Because if it's that, then you've already won the debate but lost the person. Okay? It is building a positive case for Christianity. In that sense, it is offensive. It is an offense. It's an offensive move. I am building a positive case for Christianity. We give good reasons why we believe. And we give good reasons, for example, for showing that God exists, for showing that Christianity is true. That is offensive apologetics. There is also negative apologetics or defensive apologetics. It focuses on responding to challenges to our faith. That's why it is negative. It, it waits for the offense to come and then we defend it, we counter it, we give an answer, okay? So the first one is positive apologetics, that's offensive, meaning we propose a positive case for our faith. In the second one, people are asking us or challenging us with questions about our faith and we are responding to those challenges. So it's defensive apologetics. This includes refuting objections to the existence of God. People might say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe God exists. 
for refuting objections to Christianity. I don't believe that Jesus was the Christ. I don't believe that he was God. And answers of that nature or questions of that nature. Then apologetics in, involves itself in answering those questions. Norman Geisler, who is another outstanding apologetic, apologist, said this, Apologetics is simply to defend the faith and thereby destroy arguments and every proud obstacle against the knowledge of God, which is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.5. It is opening the door, clearing the rubble, and getting rid of the hurdle so that people can come to Christ. See, the objective is for people to come to Christ. It's not for you to win a debate. By the way, it involves other disciplines. It involves other disciplines. Like what? Uh, you will see in the course of this uh, Sunday school class. By the way, um, I think the registration registers you until the end of March. Um, but we're actually going to continue with this class according to Pastor Larry, uh, until the Lord comes. No? So that's my assignment. That's the deadline of my assignment. Or until the Lord comes or takes me home, whichever comes first. No? So this is just the first part. We will have five lessons in this first series, and then we will break off maybe and do some question and answer series, uh, like, you know, where the dinosaurs in the Bible, how old is the earth, stuff like that, which you might find interesting. Okay, it involves other disciplines like history, science, philosophy, theology, ethics, archaeology sometimes, biology sometimes. We might talk about DNA here. I'm not a scientist. Uh, we might talk about algorithms here. I'm not a mathematician, but uh, we'll talk about that. So that because in some other disciplines, they explain the truth of Scripture. And that's what we want to discover. There are three essential elements of apologetics. To answer uh, tough questions about Christianity is one. To give good answers to those who ask the tough questions and then to do this in a wise, gentle, loving, engaging, uh, tactical manner. No? So that's the objective of this course. Okay. Why do we defend the faith? Maybe the first reason is Jesus gave people reasons to believe. And with this, I'd, I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Let's uh, turn our Bibles there, or click your Bibles there. Jesus was uh, revealing himself as God here in the account, in this part of the Gospel of Mark. And he was in Capernaum in this particular situation. Let me read it from verses 1 through 12. You will, uh, of course, be familiar with this story. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming or blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Of course, that's precisely the point of Jesus, right? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, 
and said to them, Why do you question these, th question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? Of course, both statements are easy for Jesus to make. Then in verse 10, that's the key verse. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And of course, he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Now that was an apologetics encounter between Christ and the people who were there. He demonstrated the truth of his message and his identity over and over again in scripture using every method at his disposal, including miracles, prophecies, a godly style of lifestyle, authoritative teaching, and reasoned Argumentation, that's how Jesus actually exercised apologetics. So he gave people reasons to believe. And in that case, the proposition was, I am God and I can forgive sins. The evidence was when he told the paralytic to rise, he rose. Because in the mind of the Jew, only God can forgive sins, and only God can make people who are paralytic rise with just one word. So therefore, Jesus forgave sins and made the paralytic rise. Therefore, Jesus is God. You get the argumentation? And that's what that passage shows us. Jesus himself gave people reasons to believe. In Acts 1.3, Jesus gave many convincing proofs. When Luke was writing to Theophilus about the book of Acts, he was saying, I have made an ordered record of the events because Jesus gave many convincing proofs of his resurrection. So Jesus himself exercised apologetics in that sense, because he gave us reasons to believe. So here in the case of the paralytic, of course, we already saw that he did the miracle and that is proof. <clears throat> in the book of Jude, verse 3, Jude told the believers to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. Luke, he was a chronicler of the church history or the history of the gospel and the apostles. He believed in eyewitness testimony and careful history. That's why he made a careful account of everything. So Jude, Jesus, Jude, and Luke used, gave reasons, gave evidence for people to believe. Well, P Peter said, we be, have to be ready to give an answer. So he encourages the defense of the faith. And Paul, in every place where he went, and especially when he talked to the Greeks uh, at the Areopagus in Acts 17, he gave them and persuaded them from Scripture. He reasoned with them from Scripture. So this is a good way to answer this question. Why, we, why should we defend the faith? Well, Jesus modeled that for us. Jude said so. We need to contend for the faith. Luke established uh, history, historical accounts, to be able to prove that what we behold is the truth. Um, Peter told us to be ready to give an answer, and Paul, he always reasoned with people from the scriptures. 
So our apologetics, our giving an answer should be based on the scriptures. It should be based on evidence of uh, the truth that we are proposing, which are in the scriptures also. And that's why you should read your Bibles. By the way, you cannot do apologetics if you don't read your Bibles. If you come here every Sunday and you make this a substitute for your own personal Bible study, then please leave. This is not that for, it's not that. That's not our objective. You come here equipped with the word because you cannot exercise the defense of the faith. You cannot give an answer about the hope that is in you if you do not know the hope that is in you. Okay? So please read your Bibles regularly. I want to end there for this particular session. We have a second part to this in this session. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> they don't want me to end first. No, because I wanted to know if you had questions that you'd like to ask at this point. That's why I wanted to end a little earlier. And so that you can, it, we, we have enough time to saunter off to the sanctuary for the 1030 service. So at this point, uh, do any of you have questions uh, about the lesson today, about uh, what apologetics is and why we need to defend the faith? The objectives of apologetics, what kind of apologetics we have or offensive and defensive and all of that. So do you have any questions? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to figure out your question. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The problem with a very big class is you might be afraid to ask questions. So, um, well, maybe next time, if, or if you have pieces of paper, you want to write them down, is that it? And then send them up here. Is that easier? You can do that. Okay. Oh, you have a question? Yes, ma'am. I cannot understand fully yung apologetic responsing disciple. Nas yung positive and negative. Pwede pa explain further. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Positive apologetics is giving a positive case for the faith, meaning uh, I will present the faith to you, and these are my reasons why. So it comes from me to you. So let's say uh, you're the questioner, and I, you're, I'm the one you're questioning. Uh, without you even challenging my faith, I will propose to share my faith to you and give reasons why. So when we share the gospel, and we give them the gospel and the reasons behind why we believe the gospel, that is positive apologetics. That's why it is a very useful tool for discipleship. Um, when we train other people uh, to grow in their faith, we actually employ a lot of apologetics. Negative apologetics is when we respond to challenges to our faith. Let's say, how do you know that there's a God? No? And you give an answer, give the evidence that you have that establishes for you the truth that there is a God. No? Um, people will often ask you that question. And one good way to answer that actually, but it's rather offensive, is you poke them in the eye. <laughs> You know why? Because the eye is enough proof that there is a God. The eye has a hundred billion, a hundred billion nerve endings 
where electricity passes through those nerve endings from the ocular nerves to the brain. A hundred billion just for the eye. So if somebody asks you, is there a God? You poke them in the eye and you use that illustration. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's what you call the wrong kind of offensive uh, apologetics. Other questions? Yes, sir. None. So when we give a testimony about our faith, we give reasons why. Because diba, the standard outline for a personal testimony is you tell them what you were before and you tell them what changed you. And of course, what changed you is faith in Christ. And when you propose your belief in Christ, you usually explain why. No? You either say, well, I read from scripture that I am a sinner and that I need God. I read from scripture that I need to believe in Christ and I will be saved. And so that's what I did. So a testimony actually is a good starting point uh, for delivering the gospel message to other people. But be prepared because sometimes when you give your testimony and you say, I believe in this, I believe in this, I believe in that, people might come back and ask, ask you why. Why do you believe that Jesus is God? Why do you believe that by simply putting your faith in him, you will be saved for eternity? So you have to be able to answer from scripture no? and reason with that person from scripture. That's what apologetics is. And so you're right. There's practically essentially no difference between giving your testimony and positive apologetics. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. That's a good question. Can you engage in apologetics if the person does not believe in the Bible? Actually, yes. But the first apologetic discourse that you probably need to have is about the truth of scripture. Uh, that's why one of the things that we will go through is explaining why the Bible is the word of God. Why do you believe the Bible anyway? You may want to ask yourself that question. Why do I believe the Bible? And the way you answer that question for yourself is also the way you answer the question with the person who does not believe in the Bible. Um, will reasoned, skillful argumentation complete your objective? Not alone. We are to reason from the scriptures and we are to reason about why we believe that the Bible is the word of God. But the one who makes them believe is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses tools. That's actually part of the second part of this lesson. The Holy Spirit uses different tools to be able to establish the truth in a person's heart. And even in your experience, you will remember that when you came to faith, the Holy Spirit actually used someone, another person, who maybe shared the four spiritual laws with you or the EE outline or the bridge illustration or somebody preached from Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10 or John 3 verses 1 to 19 and, and presented the gospel to you or 1 Corinthians 15. Um, somebody preached that you know, and you started to investigate the word and maybe in the process of your investigation you discovered that what the Bible says is really true. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. I've never doubted that the Bible is the word of God. Um, I did not always obey it, but I never doubted it. But some people do not come from that background. So they might come from a background where it is not automatic that the Bible is the word of God. And so one of the things that we will try to learn in this Sunday school class 
is why we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So that you can share that with your friends. Now, you cannot force them to believe. And there will really be some people who will not believe. No matter how skillfully you marshal the arguments for why you believe that the Bible is the Word of God. There are some people who will just... It's not that they... It's not that they can't believe. It's more a case of they won't believe. It's a matter of the will, not the mind. Remember, when a person you engage with in apologetics, there are two things that are working for him. Um, volition, which is the will, and his intellect, which is the mind. We try to address the questions that arise out of his intellect so that we can affect his will, his volition. But his will is a territory that we cannot actually deal with directly because it's a spiritual thing, and that's where the Holy Spirit works. By the way, the Holy Spirit also works in our minds to clarify, to enlighten, and frankly, if the Holy Spirit does not turn on the light for us, the natural man, what? Cannot understand the things of the Spirit because they are what? Spiritually discerned. So always remember that. But don't make that a hindrance. Ah, this guy is a natural man. He will never understand the things of the Spirit. Therefore, you are condemned. <laughs> so, that's why we're learning this course, right? So that we can help to reason with them. Other questions? It's four minutes before, yes? Okay, sir, since uh, apologetics uh, concern most issues about Jesus, how could we prove that Jesus first exists as a historical person? We have an entire series on that actually coming up, but just a short answer to that very long question. Uh, Please attend sometime in April because we will have a series on the uniqueness of Christ. Uh, and that will answer that question. We can really answer, we can really prove that Jesus uh, lived as a historical person. He's quoted by a uh, non believing Roman historian named uh, Tacitus. Uh, he was even named by him. So there are those evidences. Let's now close in prayer because it's time for us to go to the next service. Father, we thank you for our time this morning and we ask that you bless your word in our hearts and give us maybe more desire, Father, to know you through your word so that we can reason, Father, with others and bring them alongside you. Help us, Lord, to prepare our hearts for the task of evangelism by also training ourselves in the defense of the faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.